So this evening we turn to Proverbs chapter 24 for our text, which is found at the end of the chapter, verse 30 through 34. Proverbs chapter 24 from verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Someone has written, wise men profit more by fools than fools do profit by wise men. For whereas wise men will avoid the faults of fools, fools will not imitate the virtues of wise men. That's demonstrated throughout the book of Proverbs and it's presented to us again in our text this evening. When a wise man walks through the countryside where he passes a field that catches his eye. The owner of this field is a fool and a sluggard. And our wise man pauses to consider that he himself might receive instruction. Verse 32, then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. So he observed something in life that he might be profited himself by it. He drew certain conclusions from what he saw. You know, in many ways in 21st century society, that's a dying art. Everybody is running around so quickly and we have so much information to our fingertips. We ask Google a question, we get the answer, we move on that people walk around oblivious to what's actually going on around them. And because of that, we don't grow in wisdom. Or we may have more knowledge, but we don't grow in wisdom. So you and I can learn from verse 32 in and of itself that the wise man walking through the countryside saw something and he studied it. He received instruction by drawing conclusions. You were to observe life like that. You were to observe people like that. Mark the wise man. Mark the fool. Note the consequences of wisdom and folly in their lives. Well, our wise man does this and he imparts to us learning and instruction. So we have the example of how he studied to learn wisdom and we have the fruit of it in that he tells us what the wisdom is that we should learn. And I want to summarize it in this way. The poverty of the slothful. The poverty of the slothful. To begin with this evening, I want to simply expound the text under three headings. We'll look at the man, then we'll consider his vineyard, and finally, we'll look at his poverty. And then I want to apply it to two key areas of your life, that which pertains to work in general, and then uh, secondly and finally, looking at how it applies to us spiritually in the care of our souls. But as for the text itself, let's note first of all from verse 30, the man, where he's introduced to us. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Now it's a Hebrew parallel. It's referring to the same man and he does, he's described in two ways. And the first descriptor is that he is a slothful man. Sometimes in the book of Proverbs he's called the sluggard. He's a lazy person. He's indolent. He's disinclined to work. It's not that he has nothing to do. That's the great complaint that you hear from people today, old and young. There's nothing to do. I don't know what it's like here in the USA, but back in the UK, that was the great complaint of parents and children. There's nothing for the children to do. 
We need the government to make more parks. We need them to provide this and that and after school clubs. And I think back to when my father, who would be now 93 if he were living, when he was a boy, nobody complained that there wasn't anything to do. And there weren't any parks. He got up at 5.30, he met the train, collected the newspapers, did the newspaper round, went home for his breakfast, then he went to school. But it's the cry we hear today, there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. So I'll do this all day. That's the lazy man. But it's not that he has nothing to do. It's that he doesn't want to do anything. He prefers sleep over work. Verse 33, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. It's always a little, isn't it? Just a little, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. Well, if it wasn't sleep, it would be something else. Because the slothful man has a ready arsenal of excuses to avoid all responsibility and duty in life. We've considered some of them before, but to remind you, please look at chapter 20, verse 4, where on this occasion, he's using the weather as an excuse. I'll do it when the weather's better. Proverbs 20, verse 4, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold, therefore Shall he beg and harvest and have nothing? It's too cold to work today. Put on a coat, man. Get out. Start working. You'll warm up. But the sluggard won't. It's too cold. When harvest comes, he's got nothing. Then we find him in chapter 26, verse 13. And this time he has phantom difficulties. They're not even real. Phantom difficulties. The sluggard has such an array of excuses. Chapter 26, verse 13, the slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. The only thing this man is expert in is excuses. He's a slothful man. But then you'll see, from verse 30 that he's not only slothful but he's foolish he's foolish we're told that he's a slothful man and then when we meet him again in the second half of the verse he's the man that is void of understanding now he will not know that he's void of understanding he'll very likely think that wisdom has begun and ended with him and we'll see more of that in a moment but he's a foolish Nonetheless, he doesn't seem to understand that it is actually in his own best interest to work. He doesn't understand that his excuses are not serving him, they're destroying him. If he did, he would get up, he would overcome all of his disinclination to work, and he would be driven, driven to be diligent. But as I said a moment ago, this man is so void of understanding that he doesn't listen to anyone who will come and try to correct him. So were we to read on in chapter 26, the slothful who makes up this phantom excuse, he's on his bed. What do we read in verse 16? The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven seven men that can render a reason. He knows better than everybody. It doesn't matter how many people come to him to tell him, listen, you're being a fool. He's got an answer. In fact, he won't shut up. He just talks. Excuse after excuse after excuse. Maybe you have children like that. Maybe you you try to teach them wisdom. Maybe you say, why have you not done your work? And you've barely got the question out of your mouth. And it's excuse after excuse after excuse. Shut up, man. That's what this text says. You're an idiot. Stop being such a fool. But will the foolish sluggard hear? No. 
He's wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. He always has an excuse and he always has an answer. He's self deluded and he's last to see his own folly and destruction. That's the great problem of folly. The fool cannot see his own folly very often. And at the same time, he believes that he's wise. Well, here's one element of it applied to this aspect of folly, namely slothfulness. In this man, foolishness and laziness collide. You may have met these people through life. I've met a number of them and and observed them. I've seen people who need to get a job. And they have opportunities, but they don't like the job uh, that's available. And they're always holding out uh, for something down the line that's better. That They may not even be qualified for that job. Or then when they get a job, I can remember one individual in particular... No sooner did he get a job than he wouldn't like the job. And then everything would be against him in the job. The boss would be against him. Every boss he ever had was just terrible. The worst boss in the world you could ever work for. Everyone else managed to work for him, but not this particular individual. So he would start the job and then he would finish it after one or two months. Worked in a fish factory. It was too smelly. Worked in a holiday park having to clean up uh, holiday homes that people had rented. And that wasn't very nice because people left some of them in a terrible state. And so he would just jack in one job after another and it was never ever his fault. I remember my grandfather telling me when I was young... Son, get a job. It doesn't matter what job it is. Get a job. Get the lowest job that's available. Anything. Take it. Go and work in the dust carts. Do anything. Get a job. Completely different worldview. What this shows is reluctance to work, refusal to take responsibility, and contentment to doze throughout life in a guilty idleness. That's our man. He's slothful and he's a fool. But then let's consider his vineyard because this man is a farmer. And if there is ever an occupation that you will not get away with being a sluggard, it's a farmer. The farm is just going to get out of control. Well, he's a farmer. He had a vineyard. The vineyard needed care. The field had to be fenced. The ground had to be kept. The vines had to be tended and watered. If he was going to get that all-important harvest and yield. But this man's vineyard was neglected. And the result of the negligence is given in verse 31. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Well, you get the picture. The problem was his vineyard was overgrown with thorns and with nettles. Not just one or two here And there that he hadn't picked out that week. No long term. Weeds taking over the whole of his vineyard. With the result that these weeds choked the life out of the vines. And destroyed the fruitfulness of his vineyard. It was overgrown. But then it was exposed. It was exposed. The protecting wall of the vineyard had been broken down, which meant that animals could 
simply wander in and eat their fill of what few grapes were actually growing upon the vines. If you turn to Psalm 80 and look there at verse 8 through 13, you'll see how the Lord speaks of Israel as a vineyard. And it's the Lord himself who has broken this vineyard down because of their sins, but the description of it here is very pertinent to what we're considering in Proverbs 24. Psalm 80 and verse 8. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou prepared room before it and did cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent forth her boughs over the sea and her branches unto the river. Now here's the question. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges, so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. But you see, that image is exactly what is going on in this vineyard that we're looking at in Proverbs chapter 24. It's overgrown and it has no protection. The boar out of the wood doth waste it. The wild beast of the field doth devour it. Some of you plant gardens. It's been a new thing for me to do that. And you know that when you plant a garden, you've got to prepare the ground, you've got to extract the weeds, and then you need to keep your eye upon the weeds. And I did that with considerable effort throughout this year. Now, my yard is fenced in, and that was all I had to do, weed it, until Vinaya got a dog. (laughs) And we went out looking for the bell peppers that we had been waiting for weeks to ripen. And Sky had been through the vegetable bed. Now we're going to have to build a wall. Now we're going to have to put a fence up. Maybe you have to do that for deer in your yard. You know that you need to do this to protect what you're growing. Well, the slothful man here didn't do it. He didn't do it. His field was overgrown. His field was exposed. And that brings us to the third thing, his poverty. You see, the consequences of this man's slothfulness would come home. Verse 34, So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Your poverty is going to overtake you. You're going to suffer lack and destitution. Not because you don't care, not because you don't desire to have a harvest, but because you have not put the work in in order to receive the benefit. And it's very insightful the way that uh, Solomon here presents poverty coming upon this man. The first image is of a traveler. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. So imagine that you're sitting on your porch and you look out in the distance. And there on the horizon is a traveler. Maybe in the olden days, he would have a stick over his back. He would have wrapped his possessions up in a blanket, hung over the end of the stick. And there he is out in the distance. And you say to yourself, look, a traveler. And then you take your eye off him. Because he seems so irrelevant to you. He's out there on the horizon. But look at the second half of the verse. And I want as an armed man. You see, this traveler was really a highwayman. And while you took your eye off him, before you knew it, he wasn't on the horizon, but you were in his hands. That's the picture. That's the poverty of the slothful man. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. You don't see the danger. You don't pay attention. But the harvest time comes some months later. And what have you got? 
nothing. The vineyard has failed. There's no fruit. Well, we have the man, his vineyard, and his poverty. Let's apply this to our lives. First of all, by saying, you must be diligent in work. You must be diligent in work. God established three ordinances for man in the Garden of Eden. The Sabbath day, marriage, and work. Six days shalt thou labor and do all of thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Six and one. Week after week, week after week, from the beginning unto the end of the world. And when man fell into sin and we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, sin did, did not disannul this command. It simply made it terribly harder. So that now in the sweat of our brow, we would earn our crust from the earth. Man's relationship to work has changed too. We noted that a few months ago. He rebels against God's good command in two ways. Either he makes an idol out of work or he makes an idol out of ease. The Bible tells us you must be diligent in your work. We see children wrestling with this, don't we? Children, let me, let me speak to you a minute. Do your parents give you chores to do? I hope they do. Do you like doing them? Let me guess, you probably don't. And when your parents say, get your chores done, you think within yourself, oh no, chores. And maybe you don't obey. Oh, you wouldn't go up and say to your parents, no, I'm not doing my chores. You simply just disappear off to your room and pretend as if you don't have any chores to do. Well, let's give that a big name, irresponsibility. And let's give it a shorter name, laziness. It's not always easy to work, is it, children? Then you get to school. Now, many of you haven't been to public school, but many of you have been. And it was cool when I went to school not to work. The day of the test came, and the guys came walking in, I haven't done anything for this test. I haven't done anything for this test. I'm just going to sit it. And everybody then starts trying to pretend that they've done less than the other guy. Why? Because it was cool for some reason to be an idiot. <laughs> to be slothful. Bravado. Somebody would have been better to teach us diligence. Learn it when you're young, children. Then you grow into adulthood and work in our culture, is a necessary evil. It's a necessary evil. Even when people are devoting so much time and energy to it, there are, there's a reward and money, and they want that, but we've got the cult of the weekend, don't we? We work these days so that we can get to the weekend, and oh, that's, that's life, that's living. The weekend, recreation, fun, entertainment. That's the world's idea of life. It's not the Bible's idea of life. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, and the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Our culture does not have that worldview. And then Monday morning is the worst time of the week in our culture. What does that say about a biblical work ethic? It tells us we've got everything upside down. We love ease, we love indulgence. We love recreation and all those things, but we don't have a biblical view of work. Then we have the system of welfare. System of welfare. It's been an increasing phenomenon since the mid 20th century, and some of it is good. It is good and proper that those who are truly poor and vulnerable in a society have a safety net. 
that protects them. But the problem is, this thing snowballs out of proportion. With the result that people are paid to be idle and disincentivized from working. The Bible tells us that a man, if a man does not work, neither shall he eat. Imagine if our culture upheld both of these principles, that the truly poor and vulnerable were taken care of in society. But we didn't have this uh, system that could be manipulated to turn the, the, the biblical work ethic on its head. If a man had to work in order to eat, Imagine what levels of new diligence he might be driven to. Imagine what he might learn about himself. Imagine what gifts and talents he might develop. There's both good and evil in this system of welfare. You and I need to be governed by a different principle. God requires work. And so if you need to get work, strive to get work, and when you get it, be diligent in it. And if you don't have work, be diligent in the pursuit of that work. And make sure you spend your time doing all to the glory of God. Now there are some of you who are here this evening, and you cannot work providentially. Well, let me rephrase that. You cannot engage in employed labor. Of course you can work. And there are others who are seeking jobs. Well, do you see that that, that biblical principle of redeeming the time, and whatsoever your hand finds to do, do with all your might to the glory of God... That still applies. That still applies. This is not time for you to waste until you get work. This is not time to binge watch things. This is not time to waste on video games or vanity. The same principle applies. Diligence. Because you have a field. And if we were to walk past it, what would we see? What would we see? Children, I want to speak to you again. It's difficult to work. We've established that. I want you to do something. I want you to do it for your parents. I want you to do it for yourself. But I want you to do it in obedience to God. I want you to try in the strength of God to learn to be diligent as young as you can. That's what the Lord requires of you. And you young people, you've heard sermons like this when you were younger. And you're hearing another sermon like this now that you're older. And when you were younger, maybe in your schoolwork, mom had to sit and look over your shoulder and say, do this, come on, let's do this, and the next thing, do this. But should she have to look over your shoulder now? Should she have to check your work now? Should she have to fight you in order to make you productive now? You're not four, you're not five. She won't have to do that if you've embraced the biblical principle of discipline from the heart. And you're doing these things unto the Lord. It wouldn't matter whose eye was upon you in this world. God's eye is upon you. And diligence is a biblical duty. Learn to take responsibility, young people, for yourself. Train yourself to be self-disciplined. Are you diligent? Or are you slothful? Or in the context of the book of Proverbs, are you wise or are you foolish? Do you have to be compelled to work like a slave? Are you drunk on entertainment and distraction 
that kills your productivity? Or are you motivated to live to the glory of God? You see, you are forming habits now that will affect the rest of your life. And habits are very difficult things to break. And some of us who were older than you did not have the privileges that you have of being trained in a biblical worldview. And we developed those bad habits. And for the last number of decades, we have been fighting the life out of ourselves to try and break those habits that sadly we developed in our teenage years. Form these habits now. And parents, teach your children diligence and fight them if if you have to. Fight them. Make it a war of attrition if you need to, but do not allow them to adopt the foolish attitude of slothfulness. You must be diligent in work. But then secondly here, you must be diligent in devotion. You must be diligent in devotion. Your soul is a vineyard that God has given you to keep and bear fruit. And the book of Proverbs tells us that the chief thing that we must be diligent for is the care of our hearts. Keep your heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. Your soul by nature is very like what we read here in chapter 24, verse 31. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. We're overwhelmed by sin. We've no native spiritual defenses. And then God comes and by his spirit, he stirs up our hearts with new desires and he moves us to a diligent care of our souls. And when he does that, it's manifest in that we now look upon our own vineyard and we say, it's the field of the slothful man. The the foolish has now become wise. He sees the desolation. He sees that the walls are broken down. He knows that he has to do something. The Spirit gives us new eyes. And then the same Spirit gives us a motivation to act so that we get our spiritual tools out and begin to cultivate this garden of the Lord so that it might bring forth fruit unto God. You must be diligent in devotion. Well, to develop the illustration here in our text, that means you're going to have to weed your soul field. You'll have to weed your soul field. You'll have to go in and uproot all that shouldn't be there. I went to collect Caleb this evening. He was out gardening for a lady in in Mebon. And he said, I spent three hours weeding one bed and I said son the Lord had you do that because he knew what I was going to preach this evening (laughs) down on your knees picking out these weeds that shouldn't be there you need to break the ground up you need to pull the weeds out remember what the Lord Jesus says there are four kinds of ground one of them's thorny and the thorns grow up around the good seed of the word or in this case your soul its life and its vigor and they choke the vitality out of it you need to weed your soul field and then you need to repair your heart walls you need to repair your heart walls you need to put up protections in their proper place Maybe they used to be there like the wall in the sluggard's field. But the walls have gradually been broken down. You didn't pay attention to them. And through that, your soul has been exposed. The boar of the forest has come in. The wild beast and it's devoured you from the inside out. Fruitfulness has been destroyed in your Christian experience. 
Remember how we read of this in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2? Take the little foxes, the little foxes that have spoiled the vines, because our vines have tender grapes. Well, you see, your walls are broken down. The foxes have come in. They're attacking fruitfulness in your Christian life. You need to rebuild these walls of protection as Christians. And then you need to feed your hungry hearts. You clear the ground. You protect your soul from competition and danger. And you employ diligent use in the means of grace to fertilize that which you want to be fruitful in your Christian experience. Weed, repair, and feed. Because if you don't, if you don't give yourself to the diligent care of your soul, then you will endure present poverty. And all you have to do is say, a little more sleep, a little more slothfulness, a little more. Not a, not a huge thing, just a little bit more. And your poverty is going to come like him that travels. And before you know it, that which was on the horizon is going to have you in its hands. But worse than that, not just present poverty. It's possible that you will experience everlasting poverty. Why do so many people not come to Jesus Christ? Because they're spiritual sluggards. If you speak to them, they might say something like, well, you know, I should, I should take care of my soul. But they're always putting it off. They're always putting it in front of them. But then they never deal with it. And they die and go to hell. And poverty which was out there on the horizon that seemed so far off. The highwayman of hell, let's call him. There he was. And time passed. And we ended up in his hands forever. You see, slothfulness doesn't just entice us away from diligent in our, diligence in our calling or the use of our talents in life. Chiefly, it draws us away from the care of our soul. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. I'll read my Bible later. I'll pray tomorrow. I'll give attention to these things next week. Just a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. And you're in the hands of spiritual poverty. Listen to me this evening when I ask you this. As you walk by the garden of your own soul tonight, what does it look like? Does it look like verse 31? All grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Is that your soul? If you say yes, then I ask you, how did it get into that state? And the answer is, you laid off the care of your heart. You gave your mind over to every kind of vanity, but you didn't care for your soul. Pastor Law was preaching a few weeks ago, even looking after someone else's vineyard, but not caring for your own. You can do that. Pastors can do that. Trying to care for the vineyard, which is the church. Trying to care for the vineyard, which is the souls of all these people within the church. Not taking care of his own soul. What happens before you know it? The vineyard is all overgrown with thorns and nettles and the wall thereof is broken down. You need to ponder it. 
and consider it well. Because there is nothing so ruinous to Christian experience than slothfulness. It stops the voice of prayer, calls you back from watchfulness, and makes you a prey to every temptation and sinful appetite of the soul. From there, consider Christ. He didn't have to weed his soul. Praise the Lord for that. He didn't have to weed his soul. But he protected his soul continually with the wall of the word. So that when Satan came and said, hath God said to the second Adam, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. The walls of protection were up. And he fed his soul His delight was to be doing the will of the Father. His delight was to meditate upon the law of God like Psalm 1. And thus he was the tree planted by the rivers of water that brought forth its fruit in his season. Consider the contrast of slothfulness to true diligence in the example of Jesus Christ. And know that the way to heaven is long and hard and you're going to grow weary. But be very careful of saying just a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Children, you remember Christian did this in Pilgrim's Progress. And he fell asleep halfway uphill difficulty. And what happened? He had to run up the hill and back down the hill and back up the hill again because he lost his scroll. He went the whole way beating upon his breast, cursing the fact that he'd been so slothful. Well, you can learn from the hill difficulty and you can learn here from the field poverty. Slothfulness brings poverty. Diligence breeds prosperity. Therefore, we need to be careful to be weeding our souls, protecting our souls, and feeding our souls with the good seed of God's most holy word and everlasting life. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts.